Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our Survivor Summit, amplifying the voices of LGBTQ survivors in honor of Pride Month. RAIN is the nation's largest anti-sexual violence organization. We created and operate the National Sexual Assault Hotline. My name is Ebony Bethe, and I'm the clinical director here at RAIN. In honor of Pride Month, RAIN is highlighting inspiring members from the RAIN Speakers Bureau to discuss sexual violence and healing during this um, LGBTQ survivors panel. The RAIN Speakers Bureau is made up of nearly 4,000 survivors across the country, and we're excited to have them, the members share with us their thoughts around identity, gender, resilience, and healing after trauma. So I'm gonna do a brief introduction to the panelists that um, have joined us today. Um, to start with, we have Jordan Massiangelo. Jordan is a special projects manager uh, with Men Healing. Jordan has been working in the sexual violence survivor and advocacy and outreach for more than 13 years. He began publicly telling his own story of survival in partnership with the Ontario Provincial Police in Canada as part of their inaugural male victimization conference. After 25 of these award-winning conferences, Jordan's passion for activism took root and he went on to join other support initiatives, becoming a keynote speaker and educator at events and conferences across North America. He continued to garner relationships and opportunities to work with many services and outreach agencies across North America, including in Child Prostitution and Trafficking Canada, the Canadian Center for Abuse Awareness, Corrections Canada, Male Survivor, the Winnipeg Sexually Exploited Youth Coalition, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, Healthy Minds Group, as well as many First Nations support centers. Originally from Toronto, Canada, Jordan currently lives in Fort Lauderdale with his husband, where he continues to evolve his outreach work, serving as Special Projects Manager for Men Healing, a national nonprofit dedicated to helping male identifying survivors heal from sexual trauma. Great to have you, Jordan. Next, we have April Jackson, an award-winning author, speaker, and founder and president of Mercedes Closet Inc. April received a bachelor's of science and business administration from Herzing University and a master of art in forensic psychology from Argosy University. However, after experiencing violence, she took a portion of her life that wouldn't be forgotten and harnessed it into allowing her to birth April M. Jackson Hunter, LLC, which transformed her into an award-winning author, speaker, and advocate. Mrs. Jackson Hunter is also the founder and president, like I said, of Mercedes Closet Inc. Their mission, empowering LGBTQ plus survivors, allowing them to rebuild and lead fearless lives. Her core belief, Everyone needs to feel as though there is someone in their corner during a dark time. So glad to have you, April. Okay. <laughs> and our next panelist is Samantha Lynn. Samantha Lynn is an audio engineer. Samantha is a singer songwriter um, out of Seattle, Washington. She is a survivor of sexual assault and uses music to share her healing journey with others. Samantha lives with her wife and her babies, a dog and two cats, <laughs> and enjoys gardening and woodworking. Thank you so much, Samantha, for being here with us. So today we want to really get into kind of discussing a few different things. Um, I, I know you all are experts and, and can really provide our um, audience with a lot of good information. So we'll just jump right in. We often hear from survivors that disclosure is one of the most difficult decisions they face. When to tell, who to tell, how. Um, when you first shared your experience, who did you tell? And in what ways would you feel supported? And anyone can speak. I'll go first. Everybody's all quiet. <laughs> um, I was actually sexually assaulted when I was like 15. Um, I didn't really tell anybody until years after 
the fact um, that what happened to me and it was my best friend that I actually told what happened to me and she comforted me, you know, and, and helped me support myself through, you know, but after I started going through my healing journey is when my family, my wife, you know what I'm saying? My kids, they were older at this time. They became my backbone and my support system. Um, <clears throat> I just want to say that like disclosure is really an, like a crucial part of um, a survivor's healing journey. And when someone discloses to you, you have to, the person hearing that really has to take that as a gift. And my hope would be that they show that empathy towards the survivor, that that is a gift um, that they're, that they're telling them. For me, my trauma, I first disclosed actually to my high school girlfriend and uh, um, much like April said, I was supported. Um, you know, she was there for me uh, and she helped me sort of search out services and things like that. But at that time, um, I was probably 17. I was, there wasn't a whole lot for men and male identifying folks to, to find specific services. Um, so it was just dead end after dead end after dead end. And so I sort of took um, all of that courage that I had to come out with in the first place and shoved it back under the rug for a long time. Um, it was a little bit discouraging, um, but you know, I eventually found a men's uh, support group, um, which helped me sort of process a lot of that. Mm. But that was still few and far between. It took me ages to find that place, and um, it was the only one in the city. So, <clears throat> you know, there was a lot of support. My high school girlfriend was the only person I had told, and the guys in my group were the only people <laughs> other than her that I had told. And I remained in that group for a long time um, without disclosing it to anybody else. Um, I absolutely agree, Jordan, for sure. Um, it's, it's very important that whoever is being told um, that something's happened, um, that they just, they remain open to listening. For me, I, I disclose to one of my best friends, um, because when I was assaulted, it was actually at a party at her house. Um, so she was the first person that I reached out to because I didn't know what was happening. It was kind of like, did that just really happen? And I, I had to talk it out. Um, and once I did come to that realization, um, I told my mom, uh, went over to her house. She called my sister. My sister came over and they just sat in my room with me and, in silence and just remained there for support and whatever they needed. They didn't ask any questions They um, besides what can I do for you? Um, so that was really important um, for me as well. Um, but yeah, I didn't, I didn't really talk to much uh, to any other people after that, um, because there was a lot of guilt and a lot of shame. And I think that that's what prevents a lot of people from saying that because there's this stigma of shame, you know, that I allowed this to happen to me or I deserved this. Um, so once you start opening up and realizing that, um, you know, there's other people out there that can support you and know what you've been through, it really does help that healing journey start. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing. Is, were there any things that um, made you kind of not feel supported enough or were there any, was there some particular support when you did initially disclose that you were looking for? I was really nervous. I was nervous. Like I said, because I was a male identifying survivor, mm -hmm. um, I really honestly thought I was one in a million. Um, that idea in, was stuck in my head from, I was abused as a child, um, so as an early teen. So <clears throat> throughout my teenage years, I really had that idea in my head that I was one in a million because I was a man and this didn't really happen to men. So um, I held that. And then when once I did attempt to seek services and I could not find anything and it was just dead end or, you know, sort of like a very generic um, your health insurance provides a therapist for six weeks kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't specific to how I felt about things. I was like, that sort of really instilled that idea that I was one in a million. 
And so when I found the, the therapy group that I ended up joining, that opened up so many doors for me. I didn't, I still didn't disclose publicly to my family or friends, but at least I was in this community of men who, who, who understood um, the same sort of things that I, that I was feeling. And that was a huge, huge step for me. And I, I, it didn't really help me disclose publicly, but it's kind of funny, I, I publicly disclosed by accident, the group that I was in had um, decided to take part in a public funeral for a, a missing child that had been found, abandoned, and had passed away. And we decided to take part in this funeral. And me not paying attention, <laughs> um, there was a lot of news media there. And I ended up on the front page of, of the Toronto Star. And um, in the article, it had mentioned that this group of male survivors had been at the funeral and I was standing with that group. And then my dad called me, he's like, what's this? It's like, oh, okay, I guess I'll have to um, tell everybody. But it was kind of a blessing in disguise, to be honest. I was ready, I was just putting it off, but I was ready to start talking about it. So it was a blessing in disguise. So I'm happy it sort of happened like that in the long run. Absolutely. I totally agree with a lot of things that you guys said, but I wish I would have um, disclosed a lot sooner. Uh, but like I, I was at a, like I, with Samantha, I was at a party, <laughs> much too young to be at a party doing the things that I was doing. And I was with family, but it was like, even though I was sexually assaulted, it was a family member that betrayed me most and foremost. It was the family member that assaulted me. It was one of their friends, you know, and it just like, um, that was all we're gonna get in trouble if you tell or you know it was just like i feel like i was going to be in more trouble if i told what happened to me because i wasn't supposed to be where i was in the first place so i really long for that support that you got samantha and i commend that just for you when you said it i was crying a tear was coming already <laughs> because I, I wish i would have received that support I, I probably would have not gone down the road that i went down had i went through the proper channels of healing that I didn't go to too much later. So I really say disclosure is a must, just like um, Jordan said, that I encourage that first and foremost. I don't care about what you think your repercussions are going to be because you're going to need it. Absolutely. And, and honestly, like taking your time with that too, um, you know, the support that I got from the few people that I did tell, there was no pressure. Um, you know, I, I decided to report it and go to the police. I, I decided, you know, they didn't pressure me to do that. There was the, you know, asking of what, what is it that you need? Is this an option for you? Is that something that you're comfortable with? Whatever you choose, I'm gonna support. So just doing it in your own time, that's that's really huge. If you're not ready, then by all means. I, I mean, I do think that disclosure is really important just for like, you know, mental health, right? You know, because if we feel like we're on an island or one in a million, like you said, Jordan, like it's it's really hard to relate. You know, there's there's a mind and body disconnect when something like that happens to you and you just feel like no one else is going to understand. That part. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I mean, this conversation is this is so important, you know, um, RAIN has this um, kind of acronym that we use ca called TALK um, for that we encourage um, like family members and friends um, when someone in your life reaches out to you, um, use this kind of acronym when thinking about um, like how to support them and, and how to listen. And so for talk, it's like the, the T stands for um, thanking them for telling you. So, you know, because it takes a lot of courage for like you all said, like to be able to disclose, to be able to, to trust someone and come to them to tell, to tell them what you've experienced. And then the A is like, ask how you can help. Um, and like, not just asking, <laughs> but like being prepared to support you, yeah. to show up in that way that, that they asked you to, not in the way that you want to. Mm -hmm. um, and then the L is listen without judgment. Um, and, and that to me, just me, listen and, and be quiet. <laughs> we just just let, let that person tell you what they, what parts or, or cause, you may not want to disclose everything. So just being able to just listen to, to what they're willing and able to share 
And then the K is keep supporting because like, it's not a one-time conversation, right? So like, I really thank you all for, for being so open about um, your disclosure experience because the empathy is, is, is needed from those who survivors go to for support. And that's, you know, those initial people, you know, can really impact, you know, that it, those initial stages um, of healing. So great discussion. Um, each one of you has spoken publicly about your story in relation to your identity and your healing journey. And how has that affected you? Um, just being, just kind of speaking out publicly and, and just talking about your healing journey. When, when I was sort of deep in my recovery and while still going through the trauma, um, you know, my trauma happened pretty early on in my life, but then I did a lot of sort of coping things in my teenage years, um, addictions and sex work and all kinds of stuff. And, um, the idea of being gay to me when I was a kid or when I was an, a teenager, um, I sort of equated abuse with um, being gay mm. because I was uh, victimized by a man. So I didn't, that was what a gay was to me and I didn't want to be it. And I was so, I was, because of the, the roads that my life took me down, um, I was focused on survival. My identity as a gay man took a very far back seat. Um, I was just surviving. I wasn't even um, thinking about what my identity was. That was not even a thought. Um, I had to feel safe in my own surroundings before I could start feeling safe in my own skin. And that took a long time. Um, it wasn't. It was only through like sort of my own healing and the recovery process that I was able to sort of sort that out and, and, and start talking about the ideas that, oh, I wasn't made gay, I didn't turn gay because of this, or um, all that kind of, all those layers that sort of pile on top of it. <clears throat> but I didn't come out until I was 25. And um, that was because of, of sort of what had happened to me. It was just not on my radar. I didn't think of myself as gay, straight, bi, anything in between. I was just me trying to survive what had happened to me. And <clears throat> the, the support that I had got through my own recovery, um, through the folks that had helped me and all the men that I had met going through this group, they made me feel comfortable in my skin that actually coming out, coming out of the closet as gay was kind of easy because I had gone through all of that crap prior and I had put so much work and time and effort into healing from all that stuff. It said like coming out is gonna be a breeze. <laughs> I've already put in the work for everything else. Like this is just, this is nothing. Um, this is just who I am. So um, while, while the abuse really affected my identity growing up and as a young adult, um, coming out was almost joyous for me because I was like, okay, I can finally take this, this coat off and uh, really be who I am. Thank you. Well, for me, <laughs> I, um, I didn't even want to speak about what I had went through. <laughs> I, I'm behind the scenes kind of person. I'm a writer, you know, so I jotted everything down. You know, it was just like I can jot in my journal, jot in, you know, I was, used to write poetry, you know, just used to be in the backgrounds. But it was um, when I released my book is that I had to be in the forefront. So which was scary for me. And I never once considered my sexual assault, my initial trauma, because I had no buried it so far down, you know, inside that I was reeling from the, cause I'm a domestic violence survivor too, you know, but that I pictured myself as being, that, that, that is my initial trauma. And it wasn't until I started going through my healing journey and start being vocal about me being a domestic violence survivor that my sexual thoughts start rearing his head. Mm -hmm. And it was like, hey, I'm down here. Did you forget me? You know, <laughs> so and I had to start dealing with stuff all over again. But me being vocal about 
just me. Like Jordan said, I didn't even come out Jordan's in my thirties. So I was like 25. I was like, what? You know what I'm saying? Cause I'm a big grown kid. I'm not, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> <laughs> cause I was so weird with my dad and my mom, my grandma was going to say, I was like, cause I come from the, the deep South church, churches in the South. Like you, what? No. <laughs> so, and I first started being vocal and being on a platform. My platform is what counterposted me into being able to speak out. And when I started speaking out about what I've been through and other people started coming forth and started relating to me is when I started, this is healing me. I was like, this is helping me. You know, so me being vocal about what I've been through, me being speak, speaking about my, my trauma, it's really therapeutic for me. So um, I encourage people to, once you find your voice, use it because that not only helps others, it does help yourself. Absolutely. I I mean, I, I feel very um, privileged to have the family that I do um, because I, I mean, it was known that I was gay before I came out as gay. Just, you know, my mannerisms, I'm very androgynous. I was a tomboy growing up. And, you know, in fact, when I had a boyfriend in high school, my mom was like, are you sure? Um, you know, it just, it just was, it was very natural for me to come out. Um, and I, I live in a very um, kind of open community too in the Seattle area, which was pretty cool. Um, but for me, in relation to being sexual, sexually assaulted and the trauma, um, I have always been perceived as one of the guys, which is really hard as a woman um, who dates women um, because there's a lot of misogyny that is, uh, you know, I guess directed not maybe towards me, but like, hey, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, you get it because you you date women too. So there's a lot of that kind of background that I see that maybe um, more femme presenting lesbians don't see um, or straight women might not see. Um, so I, I was definitely subjected to that. And, um, you know, in that there was a, a, a misplacement of trust that I had with some of my guy friends um, because it was, you know, understood like, you know, any, even any random strangers or anything, if they knew that I was gay, like you don't even try hitting on me, this isn't going to work out or um, that kind of thing. Um, but regardless of that, um, still being sexually assaulted by a male friend, um, is is huge and it it kind of opened my eyes to realizing that no matter how i was presenting myself um as either you know more androgynous than anything else and just completely uninterested that it doesn't factor into um predators it really doesn't they are going to do what they want to do regardless of how you are presenting yourself so that was a, a huge eye opener for me Jordan, every time you, I mean, Samantha, every time you talk, you make me cry. <laughs> <laughs> Drink some water, girl. <laughs> Get hydrated. I'm like, every time she starts talking, and the tears are like, oh my God. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> no worries. No worries. <laughs> we all may have that moment. So, <laughs> no judgment zone here. Oh my God. <laughs> Samantha, you're going to owe me a drink when you leave here. I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for um, for sharing that. It was very powerful. Um, each of you have showed up in different advocacy ways to share your experiences. Um, starting with Jordan, um, how was it for you to share your story on the Oprah Show, and how was it sharing your story with other male survivors of sexual violence? Um. Well, first of all, I mean, before I went on Oprah, I was already um, involved in some outreach stuff. Uh, and like I said earlier, I think for me, community is essential in um, healing from sexual victimization. I think, uh, like I said, growing up, I felt I was like a freak accident. I was one in a million. This doesn't happen to anybody. And regardless of your sexuality or gender identity, I think many survivors feel that way. Um, and as a marginalized group, queer people, I think that adds on top of it, right? So knowing that when I did meet other men, 
I felt like there's like an, in, an instant connection. So sharing my story with another group of men who also have maybe not a similar story, but they get it is so empowering. Um, that's why I think community is so essential when you're going through your own healing journey. Um, and being on Oprah, so, you know, I was kind of, I was doing some outreach work already and, um, and we were at, when I was contacted by her producers to do it, I was scared. <laughs> um, you know, I had been doing some, some advocacy work, but I, I, not on that scale. And, um, I was scared, but I knew I had to do it. I wanted to be part of it. Um, it was such, Oprah's obviously such a public national, international forum. And this was something, it was in uh, 2010. Um, she was putting on an episode of Male Survivors. It was something that hadn't been, you know, it's always been taboo, um, that had never been done on, especially on television before. And she gathered 200 um, male survivors from across North America and brought them all to Chicago and did a, like a, she was supposed to do one episode. And at the end of it, she was like, screw it, let's do a whole nother one. So she just went and changed and came back. And she's like, this is important, let's keep going. So it ended up being a, a two part episode. And I knew going in that this was gonna be big. And when I was there, I was like, this is opening the floodgates for millions of other, um, men and male identifying people who have felt the way I felt super marginalized, even within the survivor community, um, that <clears throat> this was opening those floodgates. Like we are here, you know, just like everybody else, we are here. And um, it was huge. And I knew I had to be a part of that. So that's why I went on. And then um, a few years later, they called me up again. They're like, we want to do one of those, where are they now? Uh, segments. Mm -hmm. I said, let's do it because I'm like, I was here when I went on the first time and I was all the way up here when I went on the second time. So um, it was, it was incredible. It was an incredible experience. It was great to be part of that movement um, because it really opened up a lot of doors, even just for service providers and things like that to really start supporting men, men and male identifying people um, of sexual victimization. So Amazing. <laughs> so, April, how was it like speaking on domestic violence and entrepreneur her Mondays? <laughs> and how do you think it furthered the conversations for same sex relational domestic violence? Um, first, uh, um, foremost, that was a great opportunity. It was my first time ever being on the radio, mm -hmm. you know, so <laughs> I've never been something so I'm not as fancy as Oprah. <laughs> I'm gonna need Jordan's autograph. Yeah, yeah, no, one day, one day. <laughs> I want Jordan's autograph too. <laughs> right? Okay. okay. No. <laughs> but seriously, um, in doing that, in doing that um radio radio interview, it opened so many more opportunities for me. And I did not know that one of the hosts had been through a uh, same-sex domestic violence um episode as well. And he shared it on the interview as well. And it was so Mind blowing for me because here I am thinking I'm the only gay person in the room. He stole the thunder for me completely. But still, but yeah, <laughs> like I was speechless. I was like, oh my god, thank you for sharing. You know what I'm saying? It just so many more people were come were coming to me. You know, wanting to be open and be visual. I mean, not visual, verbal about their experiences. And like I say, once I start speaking, people tend to open doors. And I just like being that the elephant in the room, you know, because it's like, you can pretty much see when I go around my wife that we're gay, but nobody can really look at you and, and tell that you are a survivor. And so when you start being vocal about your experiences, you start getting other people like, oh my God, I never told anybody or, you know, and, and I did um, had one of my daughter's friends come to me and said she had experienced the gang rape. She had been gang raped. She never told anybody. And just for me, just for her hearing me gave her the strength that she needed to first go and disclose and then start seeking help. So that was just like groundbreaking for me. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Samantha, in your song, Be Anyway, how do you think music creates healing? 
Um, so I, I didn't write that song until uh, a few months after um, I was assaulted. So there was, there was still that, that um, very beginning of healing time for me of, you know, not, not really talking about it and disclosing. Um, but I, I the, everyone around me could tell something was wrong. Right. You know, I, I went through a very, very huge depression, um, you know, um, suicidal ideation. And just I, I isolated myself from a lot of people that I loved. And, um, you know, and people were asking me, hey, are you OK? Like, you know, is something going on? Um, because people could tell uh, just based off of my behaviors. And so I wrote that song um, kind of as a response to talk about it without talking about it. Um, you know, talking about how, yes, I, I know that I look like I've lost a lot of weight. It's because I'm not eating. Um, you know, I, I, I know that you can tell that I'm tired. It's because I'm not sleeping. You know, it's, um, you know, being able to discuss that while it may look like, you know, labored breathing for me. I'm trying to calm a panic attack, you know, just being able to discuss that something is going on. Um, but I'm, I'm just not ready to talk about it with you guys. So here's, here's my, my way of being able to express it. Um, it was very healing, absolutely very healing. Um, anytime I I've played that song in public or, or, posted it on social media, I have people reaching out to me and, and saying thank you and I can relate. And, um, you know, just like how April was saying, like people will come up complete strangers and say, I've, I've been sexually assaulted too. Um, so thank you for sharing that kind of thing. And, and again, it creates that connection, like what Jordan was saying, like this instant connection of community and understanding that we're not alone. So it definitely helped me with that. All right. Well, as we all know, no two, two survivors experience trauma and healing in the exact same way. Um, and so I'd like us to explore a little bit about the differences in each of you all's he healing experiences and ways of kind of um, reconnecting or um, establish establishing new connections um, in within your communities. Um, so April, um, when did you turn to literary work um, of art for your healing and how did literary work show up for you? Um, well, like I said, I'm a survivor of domestic violence as well as a sexual assault. Um, when I was um, younger and my kids were pretty much, they were probably still babies. I was I was losing my mind. I thought I was losing my mind, you guys. I thought I was going crazy. I, I could not sleep. Um, I was having very bad nightmares. Um, but I was suffering from PTSD. I did not know it at the time. So I literally took myself into a mental health clinic and I told the lady, I think I am losing my mind. And she started talking to me and um, I was suicidal. I did not have any intentions of killing myself, but I had suicidal thoughts. So um, at this point, I was literally like, take my kids. because I think I am going to, you know what I'm saying, lose it. So um, after after her talking to me for um, pretty much an hour and she was just like, um, no, baby, you are not losing your mind. You have PTSD. I had major depression. I was had anxiety, which I was having panic attacks as well as insomnia and all those eggs in one basket. I had, um, you know, <laughs> so um, she was like after I got on medication to relax or get some sleep, you know, um, she one of my visits, she was like, um, I think maybe you should start keeping a journal. She was like, just start journaling. When you wake up in the morning, just start journaling what you see in your nightmares or what you see in your dream, what you can remember. So I started journaling. And after going back and reading those journals a few years later, I just started adding to it. The journals helped me get rid of my nightmares, which I came to find out that there wasn't really nightmares. They were memories that I was running from. So I started... <laughs> Elaborating around my journal, elaborating around my journal, and I birthed the book a few years later. So that kind of <laughs> helped me get whatever was in my head that jumbled up crazy nightmarish memories out of my head on paper. And I was able to start my healing journey and move past a bad part of my life. Awesome. Um, 
Awesome. Thank you. So, Samantha, how did music find you in your pain? And what was it like creating and writing songs? Um, so I, I've been um, writing songs for a long, long time. I, I started when I was really little. I would just write poems about any random things. Um, and then when I taught myself guitar at, at 13, those poems just kind of took a natural progression into adding melodies. Um, and so for me, songwriting is, is very personal. I am not a songwriter where someone can come up and say, hey, can you write me a song about this? I'm just, I, I don't process that way. I don't work that way. So um, my songs are kind of more like timestamps in my life of things that have happened to me or just experiences. And, um, and I, uh, try to, I try to word them in ways that can be relatable to other people. Um, and use analogies, um, which people end up being like, oh yeah, I, I understand what that's like. Um, so songwriting, um, I can't force it. I just can't, you know? Um, so when something comes to me as as easily as how Be Anyway came to me, um, it's, it's, a, it's a waterfall of emotion. It's, it's not something that can really be stopped and you just gotta write it down. Um, sometimes it comes at very inopportune moments and you're like, I'm busy and I, I can't, you know, like, wow, that's really good. I got to get this out. But, um, you know, it, you just got to wait for the next flow to come. Um, at least for me, I, I can't be a workhorse when it comes to writing stuff down. I got to let, just let it come naturally. I agree with that. <laughs> I think that's how all creative minds work because I've jot down several book titles that I've got to write a book about because I used to be doing something like, boom, oh, that is so good with my paper. You know, this is, yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> Why are you driving? Why are you cooking? <laughs> I keep a notepad in my purse, in my car. It's like everywhere. It's a notepad and a pen because I'd be like stuck on, stuck on envelopes. I'd be like, I need a pad. Just let me, yeah. <laughs> well, Jordan. How was it like discovering the healing power of traveling and outdoor adventure? And can you kind of talk a little bit about how the outdoors um, really create a space for your healing? Sure. Yeah. You know what? I was, um, I grew up in sort of a rural setting. I grew up in the country in Canada and um, I was always sort of an adventurous outdoor guy. I really thrived in that space of being outside. Um, but the trauma sort of took that all away. I was so, after the after um, I was sexually abused as a kid, all of that sort of disappeared. Um, and then my, like I said earlier, my entire focus was on surviving, was on that survival bit. So th all of those sort of things that I enjoyed and that I liked uh, were gone for a long time. Um, that stripped away. I'm a survivor of sexual abuse and trafficking as it, as it, as I got older, and <clears throat> all of that, those layers of of violence and abuse on top of each other, stripped me bare of sort of any kind of emotion. Um, you know, I basically knew um, anger. I knew what happy was, <laughs> but there was no sort of spectrum in between those two things. It was like one or the other. Um, I became very frank in, in the way I was. It was just like everything was black and white. And I just became this shell of a person. And so about 10 years ago, uh, my husband and I were in Peru and we were, we did the Machu Picchu thing and we're standing up here on Machu Picchu, this like ancient civilization on top of a mountain in the middle of a jungle. And it was, I got, I had the sense of like a uh, freedom, um, an exhilaration that I hadn't experienced in decades. And he took note of that. He was like, Something, something's changing here. And I'm like, it is. And I don't really know what it is, but all this stuff kept flooding back. Like I'm feeling stuff now that I don't even know what it is. Um, the next morning we were, we were, we were having a coffee or something outside at a cafe and, um, Lima or something. And he's like, you know what? You need to come do this. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, you need to find somewhere you want to go. You go on your own and you go and you get that feeling again, take as long as you want and I'll be here when you get back. 
And I said, all right. So six months later, I packed my backpack and I went to South America and I was gone for three months. And I, um, you know, from the deserts of Chile to the beaches of Ecuador to the Amazon jungle in Bolivia, I really went out and I lived and I met people and I saw new places and I, I um, put myself in those <clears throat> situations and different cultures and different people. And that had mm. like incredibly profound um, uh, effect on me. I knew that I could handle myself in those situations now because I was so afraid before. Um, I was afraid of new people. My life was, my, my scope was like this before that. But traveling and being outside and being, going on these adventures, like opened that up, broke it open. Um, and it was a huge stepping stone in, in my recovery. And I started, I did all kinds of crazy stuff when I was down there. Um, and I really found that adventure and travel has this ability to compel so like self-awareness like body awareness self-awareness trust interpersonal skills um problem solving all of that stuff promotes this incredible growth and confidence uh and empowerment and i think if you really allow different people different cultures different places different things and what your bubble has taught you to um if you let it in, you can have this profound personal change. And that's what happened for me. And ever since, you know, that was 10 years ago. And ever since I've been doing crazy travels and adventures the last 10 years, you know, I'm 32 countries in and we, um, my husband joins me on some of them, depending, I'm a little, I'm a little more adventurous than he is. Um, but um, it's been, it's been my saving grace. And I really think it, you know, it's not for everybody, but I think it can be for a lot of people. They just let it happen, you know, like let, let, that, let that in. That's amazing, Jordan, that you do that. I don't like wildlife, so I think I'm going to pass on some of this. <laughs> I won't find you in the Amazon anytime soon, April. No. <laughs> I'm going to be the one with the whole mosquito tent all over me. Uh -huh. Bug spray in the fly swatter. They're gonna, they're gonna be looking at me like, where is she going? They're gonna be <laughs> a nature I walk. <laughs> yeah, a nature walk. We'll go a little I don't like at all. Jordan, I'm not playing. I don't even like ladybugs and camouflage. I'm I be freaking out. They be looking at me like, where is wrong with you? Listen, mm -hmm. I don't like wildlife. I'm, I'm not ashamed to say that. No, good. I mean, I like I said, it's different for everyone, but for me, it was like that. That really kind of showed who I was. I did. I did a week of of um, um, hiking with an indigenous man in the Amazon jungle. Just me and him, no tents, nothing. We slept under a mosquito net, and I was just like, "This is like it's really showing me that I can I can do this." You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> you are amazing, like seriously, I cannot believe how amazing that you are. You are very amazing. You are. April. One night he gave me the first night we were sleeping in jungle. Um, this guy gives me a, a, he carves like a pointy end of a stick and he goes here because it was getting dark. I'm like, what's this for? And he's like, Jaguars. And I was like, what? Check, please. <laughs> <laughs> it was too late. We were already miles in the jungle. <laughs> you say what? No, I'm good. We were already miles in. I yeah, was like, where, uh -huh. where's the airport? So, where's the what airport? am I supposed to do? And he's like, <laughs> he's like, nothing will happen because, you know, there's two of us, but just in so, case. Mm -hmm. I slept like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you need to sleep? I have like, super bags in front of my eyes and my eyes yeah. are all bloodshot red because they're going to be open for, yeah. No. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At some point in my life, I will tap into my inner Jordan. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Something yeah. probably will never happen for me. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you all for sharing. <laughs> Well, part of the reason um, the team here at Rain was so excited about this panel um, was because really we really wanted to amplify the advocacy work you all are doing um, for survivors and to provide a space to amplify the um, voices of and experiences of survivors in the LGBTQ community. Um, for the next part of this conversation, I'd like to dive a little deeper into how we can ensure um, that LGBTQ survivors feel supported 
seen and heard. Um, because of course, we're an organization always looking at how can we do better? How, how can we grow? How can we provide more support? So, um, and, and how do we talk to the public about it? So what do you all think is important for LGBTQ survivors to know about healing after sexual violence? Um, what do you wish maybe you would have known? I, go, ahead. go ahead, April, go ahead. I oh, know, I just um, wish they offer more support. This is, a, that is the reason why I started my nonprofit because when I was going through, I didn't have support. I didn't have uh, resources to go to. So it was like, I'm out here on a ledge, so I'm learning it by myself. So I, this this panel, is amazing and it is groundbreaking because this it needs to be talked about it needs to be shared because we tend to be so open and proud about who we are as in a lifestyle but so closed and closeted about when we go through trauma and i just to get the word out just be vocal about what your experience are so somebody who is going through this know that there is a light at the end of the tunnel and you can get through it so just put in a face to someone who looks like them that they can relate to that has been through what they're going through is so monumental. Exactly. I think, you know, it seems a bit cliche, but representation really does matter, like April was saying. I mean, having queer youth um, be able to see and hear folks <clears throat> who look like them and have had experiences like them um, will give them a sense of belonging where they can where they can trust to go to places to get help. Exactly. Normal, normalizing um, queerness um, and that the the idea that, you know, we are, like there's a lot of statistics around it, like one in four women, um, one in six men. I couldn't tell you the, the statistics on, on LGBTQ as, as, a gen, as a general thing, but I know it's um, huge especially yeah. in the transgender community. And I think by normalizing the, the idea that um, queerness is here, we're around, and we are all amazing, joyous people, but also that this stuff happens disproportionately to us as well. Absolutely. Um, knowing and seeing, seeing faces like ours uh, talk about this really sort of helps normalize that, that idea that you, something can happen to you and you can sort of come out the other end. Um, but normalizing queerness in general, I think is really, really important to see and hear us so that these kinds of conversations can happen in the first place. Absolutely, yeah, community matters. Um, you know, I mean, I, I every year I go to my pride parade in Seattle and, and all the different events happening. And, um, you know, you're right, we do celebrate like, hey, who we are and everything, but there is still a lot of trauma um, and a lot has to do with with sexual assault and um, just um, being comfortable in your own body to begin with. Um, and the fact that we're talking about this, it just, it really does show how common it is. And a lot of people forget that. You know, you just named a couple statistics, Jordan, that are just mind blowing because you can put three strangers in a room, three women in a room and, and understand like, we know more about what other people are going through than what other people think. Mm -hmm. You just gotta speak out, speak out against it, speak out for support as loud as you can. Absolutely. Yeah. And for other queer youth to know that, or not even queer youth, queer people in general, that they deserve the help that they need. Absolutely. The part, They're really that that part. They are deserving of it. Um, and you know, there's, there needs to be an expectation that, that needs to be provided to them as well. <clears throat> That's like one of my key things that I say when I do, it's like on all of my literature, um, violence has no sexual preference. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, violence doesn't care if you male, woman, gay, straight, it does not. So it needs to be a platform to generalize that, generalize that, that we can be able to come forward. It doesn't matter who you are, who you look like or what your background history is, you deserve to get some respect about what happened to you. It's started to be a, a street, a platform. A, I'm sorry, I'm, the word has failed me, but it deserves to be. Everyone is is worthy of healing, everyone. Yeah. You're worthy of reaching out and, and going through that process. It's gonna be difficult, but you're worth it, absolutely. absolutely. And that you don't have to do it alone. There is community there. Yeah, totally. Is there anything um, 
that you would tell a survivor who is like weighing whether or not they should disclose their identity and their story? Um, is, is there anything that you would say to someone who's kind of not sure what next move to make <laughs> in disclosing? I, I think you, those two things can exist separately. Um, they did for me. I, when I disclosed my story, I didn't disclose um, uh, my sexuality. Um, <clears throat> I think they can successfully be told in separate things if that works for that person. Um, mm -hmm. so they are almost and always intrinsically linked, but um, they don't have to be told in the same in the same story. And I think that that is 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 important for everybody to know that because you're disclosing your um, the sexual violence that happened to you doesn't mean you have to come out um, and vice versa. and vice versa. It's just it's come a disclosure is like an exercise in empowerment, right? So you had something taken away from you, and now you get to decide who um, you <laughs> tell, right? Um, but disclosing your um, your sexuality or gender identity that's just who you are. You're not choosing that, so that's a very different journey. And although they're often linked. Um, um, throughout someone's life, there are two separate things that that the individual can sort of choose to, depending on where they're at in their own recovery. I totally, absolutely agree. I, I'm gonna use myself as prime example. I never, like I said, I never wanted to be a speaker. I never wanted to be in front of the camera or to be vocal about anything that happened to me. And my coach told me it's not because of lack of education or lack of knowing how to talk. It is to the fact is I'm from. I can say like the, let's say the ghetto of Georgia, I'm from the hood, you know, so I use a lot of street slang. I use a lot, you know what I'm saying? Broken English, even though I have a, a master's degree, I, I'm around my people, I'm around my people, you know, and I never wanted to um, be in front of a camera, be in front of people speaking. And my coach told me to be yourself because there's somebody out there that yes. needs to hear what you have to say. There's somebody in the hood right now needs to see your face and needs to hear your voice and all that it entails. So I'm going to say this. I'm going to say like my coach told me somebody got that needs to hear you needs to hear your message. So this is your time. Your time is now break the silence, stop the cycle and put it out there. Absolutely. I, that's so that's so wonderful to hear. Be yourself when it comes to disclosure and, and do it on your own time. Um, I think for me um, to say something that I wasn't prepared for, and perhaps you guys experienced this too, um, I lost friends. I lost friends and it hurt just as much um, because whether or not they believed me or they did truly believe me and decided to still not support. That was a that was an earth shattering realization. Um, so if you are if you are weighing whether or not you want to disclose, like just keep in mind you will have this you know massive community of support surrounding you. Um, but it, it, there will be some challenges, and you might not have the same people in your life that you had before. And if you do have that, great, that's fantastic, but just be prepared. That goes with disclosing sexual violence or coming out. People, people, you don't really know their true um, selves unless you say something that, you know, just really is the last thing for them and they don't want to be a part of that. It hurts, but it actually ends up helping in the long run too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I agree. Okay, so, um, as one of our wrap up questions or, or our wrap up question, I just wanted to know in what ways can we continue this conversation for the LGBTQ community around sexual violence? Um, is the, and not just around sexual violence, but also I'm thinking around sexual violence and mental health, because like each of you have like talked about sexual violence and trauma and some po components of mental health. So like, how can we create that conversation and keep that conversation going? You already do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Things like um, this yeah. stuff is so important for for um, queer people to hear and to watch and to see because it's things like this where when somebody who <clears throat> feels marginalized is watching something like this and they say, you know what, maybe I can go tell my friend. 
Yeah. These people are talking about it. Um, it's sm it's small steps like this. I mean, there's a huge, larger systemic problem um, with queer people that that hinders a lot of the work that we all do. But it's a ba about making those baby steps <clears throat> towards those big ones because we're never going to flip the government overnight. But those sy sy systemic things can be chipped away at um, as long as we're having the relationships that we have. Uh, like this. So it is important for people just to know that there's stuff out there. And when you're ready, we got you. Yep. Jordan got you because Jordan is <laughs> <laughs> We're putting it all on Jordan. Yes. <laughs> Jordan <is good. laughs> Are there any final words um, or messages um, you'd like to share for survivors or loved ones? Um, whether or not you decide to disclose whoever's listening to this, I believe you 100%. Yeah. And if you are a family member of anybody that's coming to you and is willing to disclose, just be there. Listen. And just to know that, you know what, it, it's, it's not easy. I'm not saying any of this is a cakewalk. It isn't for anybody. Um, there's, uh, I think Samantha said it earlier, there's the challenges and there's heartache and there's tons of pain, but that is, in the end, it'll be so worth it. Like, <clears throat> you know, you need to keep, if that, if that little flicker of light, it may be at the far end of that tunnel, but you just keep marching towards it because it'll get bigger, it'll get bigger. Uh, you'll trip a thousand times along the way, but you'll eventually get there. Absolutely. Healing is, is not a clear, direct path in line. Yeah, it's two steps forward, one step back, maybe five steps back. Yeah. But you just keep moving. Mm -hmm. And it is definitely okay to not be okay. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much um, for just being a part of this panel and just really accepting this space to t kind of talk about your experiences. Um, it was so great to learn so much about you all and to learn from you all. So um, April, Jordan, Samantha, you all made this such a powerful and amazing panel. And I'm so honored to have been able to do this with you. Is it okay for them for us to share where they can find us on social media? Sure. Oh, you guys can find me all across social media. I'm on Facebook and Instagram at April M. Jackson Hunter or Mercedes Closet Inc. You guys can find me on Twitter at Mercedes Closet. You guys can also find me on TikTok at the author April M. Jackson Hunter. And you can find me at, you know, if you want to watch, look at a bunch of travel photos, you can find me at J Massey, M A J M A S C I on Instagram. But more importantly, check out um, the organization I work for, menhealing.org. Um, we put on healing retreats for men and male identifying folks, and we have a lot of resources for male survivors of sexual uh, victimization. So please check us out. Sign up for our newsletter. Um, it, sent, it sends out, we send out every two weeks, everything that's going on with our organization. Um, and uh, if you need help, any male identifying survivors need help, give us a call. Uh, you can find me on Facebook. I do have a Facebook music page. I also have my website, samanthalynmusic.com. Um, right when you get there, there's going to be resources for um, links to RAIN, um, as well as other sexual assault resources. Um, if anyone needs to reach out, you can also privately message me on that website. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you all for sharing. And thank you all for joining us today for this incredible conversation. Um, a very special thank you again to our amazing panelists today for sharing their stories and experiences. If you want to hear any more from RAIN Speakers Bureau members, check out RAIN Survivor Story Series at rain.org backslash stories. Have a great day.